All right. Congrats to Paul uh, on another successful meeting. It's been really great seeing this meeting grow so much, and thank you for to the organizers. It's an honor to be here. Um, so I'll talk about some pseudo-aneurysm therapies here, a little bit of a niche presentation. No disclosures. So uh, aortic pseudoaneurysms, as aneurysms in particular, we'll focus on here, uh, very uncommonly encountered, usually from post-procedural, post-operative interventions, and they're often fatal if they're left untreated. It can result in rupture, fistulization, uh, or they can compress or erode on any nearby structures as well. Uh, surgical repair has been reported, but there's very high morbidity and mortality with up to 30% of patients not surviving for the first 30 days. There aren't any on-label devices for percutaneous therapies at this time, and there really aren't any trial data. Uh, there probably never will be either, just because of the low incidence. Lots of case reports. Uh, there is one case series in literature, which we'll go over in just a minute. A variety of techniques are reported to treat these. Uh, initially, there was some excitement about thrombin plug injection, coil embolization, some stent grafting, but much more common is to use occluder devices. And the whole goal of all of these is just to induce uh, thrombosis and to hopefully seal off that pseudoaneurysm. As you can imagine, imaging is crucial here, in particular 2D and 3D TE and fluoroscopy. Uh, a couple reports of using ice, but primarily it's been uh, under TE and fluoroscopy uh, to close these. Lots of paraprocedural planning is very helpful, in particular with CTA, and then having a heart team meeting as uh, generally these patients won't be undergoing surgery, but uh, it's good to just have your surgeons involved. Device sizing and catheter delivery can be tricky, particularly if these are very large. Uh, some you'll see in the case that I'll talk about here, just trying to reach the os of the pseudoaneurysm, uh, you might not have catheters that are long enough, and that can obviously limit what your options are for treating it. Vascular plugs in particular are, are a good choice just because the delivery sheets can be a little bit smaller. The first percutaneous approach uh, to treat these was reported in 2005 by John Carroll here in Denver. Uh, anatomy here is very important. You want to have a narrow neck to make sure that your device uh, is seated well and won't uh, embolize after you close it. Serial CTA long term to uh, assess any extrusion uh, from the device and make sure that it's sealed off is important. Uh, there are a couple reports of long-term failure with recanalization, uh, most of which those patients end up having to go to surgery at that point. The one case report that does exist is a 10-patient case series uh, with su successful deployment in all 10 patients. There are two that required re-intervention. Uh, one was a few months later and one was about a year later um, for uh, recanalization. There weren't any periprocedural or post-procedural complications uh, and complete exclusion Exclusion of the pseudoaneurysm was seen in four of seven patients. Uh, they lost two to follow up, and then one patient did require operative intervention later. Uh, so I do have one case uh, of a case like this. It was a 78-year-old woman with a very complex past medical history, which we'll go over briefly here. So initially had severe AS with an ascending aortic aneurysm, underwent surgical aortic valve uh, replacement with a 21 uh, Edwards Magna bioprosthesis, and an aneurysm repair with resection back in October of 2017. She also has a fib. she's on warfarin with a prior stroke and DVT and a PE while on warfarin. One month post-op from that procedure, uh, she had an acute type A aortic dissection with emergent surgical repair required with a 30 millimeter hemishield graft uh, via circulatory arrest and a hemi-arch replacement. Intra-op, they found a one centimeter tear adjacent to the aortotomy suture line uh, in the right anterior ascending aorta. Then, two months post-op, she had a chest wall abscess with metastinitis and required wound debridement and a wound vac uh, to be placed. Eventually, did recover and was able to return home. However, five months post-op then presented uh, to an outside facility with chest pain. A CT uh, was initially performed there uh, with concern for a root hematoma, but the imaging was not optimized uh, for her complex anatomy. She was transferred, repeat imaging then demonstrated a large anterior contained aortic root rupture with a pseudoaneurysm that had developed. Uh, there was compression of the distal aorta and the carina was also noted. So cardiac surgery was consulted, but as you can imagine in this patient who was already complex, a uh, second reduced renotomy was felt to be too high risk. So we were consulted to evaluate for percutaneous options. Uh, chest x-ray, you can see a very, very wide mediastinum. And you'll see in a minute, it has a pretty tortuous aorta as well. Uh, CT was performed with a dissection protocol measured to be about a 12.8 millimeter os with a large pseudoaneurysm anterior to that. And you can uh, take note of the very tortuous aortic anatomy, which was concerning just to try to reach this uh, pseudoaneurysm. Um, she had an echo here. You can see there's flow into the large pseudoaneurysm anterior to the aorta there. 
So the plan was uh, to address this large contained root rupture with a pseudoaneurysm and that had a small os that appeared appropriate for a transfemoral retrograde arterial approach. The aorta was quite tortuous and support and catheter lengths were gonna be important. We wanted to make sure we had all the equipment available. Uh, the hope was that we could wire the pseudoaneurysm via the neck very carefully, obviously, with our concern for rupture and deployed an ASD occluder device, make sure that it doesn't interact with any of the coronary ostia and do this all under very close guidance with our uh, echo, uh, echo people. Interoperatively, uh, we were able to get some pretty good images. You can see some flow into the pseudoaneurysm os here. I do have lots of pictures and I know we're short on time, but I'll try to run through it. Uh, we were able to get a stiff wire into the, through the os and into the pseudoaneurysm. And you can appreciate that with the wire here. I don't know if that's showing up there, but uh, the wire is in uh, the pseudoaneurysm that was visible on TE. Um, we were then able to deploy a device uh, across the os uh, that appeared to be well positioned. We still had it attached here. I have a picture of the fluoro coming up and pulling the device back against the, the wall here with the pseudoaneurysm at the, bo the bottom and the aorta up on the top. And our final position did not appear to show much, if any, flow around the device. And on Cine, this is probably some of the best films, so you can appreciate just how large the pseudoaneurysm is here. And we were able to wire it, and you can see just a little bit better picture of that pseudoaneurysm. And then with the device there, you don't see any flow left there. Just watch that one more time. Just reaching that pseudoaneurysm os was quite difficult. That was probably the toughest part of the case. Um, then we did, were able to get a CT post-procedure. It appeared that the device was in good position and there already was thrombus forming within the pseudoaneurysm. The patient felt well. Uh, 3D reconstruction showed the device was in place. Um, so we were, were successful in treating this percutaneously. We had transfemoral access. As I mentioned, it was tough, difficult to navigate there, but eventually got there. A 16 millimeter device was deployed and we noted decreased flow. Coronary access looked just fine. Um, so learning points here. It's uncommon, but it's very high uh, mortality and morbidity to address this surgically. A percutaneous approach is uh, feasible and can get good results, but is challenging at times. The heart team approach is very important here and imaging also played a huge role. Close follow-up is recommended given that there is reports of recanalization. And thank you to Paul and the MHI team. Excellent case. And we're gonna keep moving here, guys. So the next speaker will be Dr. Brown talking about, I've been doing this a long time, but. I have to say for the last case, it was a brilliant result, but uh, the use of a stiff pre-shaped wire uh, into the pseudoaneurysm I think was genius given the tortuosity. So it's a phenomenal case. Okay, so I uh, only have to see here. Um, so thank you, thanks uh, for that, and again, uh, Paul Subash and the organizers. Okay, start. I click start. And uh, is volume turned up uh, enough? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, obviously, is sort of that interesting piece of uh, how old are you? And uh, I walked in the room with Bill O'Neill, who was here a minute ago, if he's not still here. Uh, I think he's the only person in the room who's done TAVR longer than I have or before I did. And um, it's, not, it's not hard for you to imagine, and many of you saw some of the beginnings of it, but this is almost a, a story of, uh, I've been doing this for a long time, or uh, can you tell age by the number of dog years you've done TAVR? So uh, this is, uh, this is uh, obviously 1999. Mac decided something was changing in the world and he better learn to cath. And so this was a case where I gave him the wire for a 99% LAD and you know, Mike's come on to become a, a cardiologist as well as a surgeon over time. And that led us, uh, 
you know, through this when Cribier did the first case in 2002 and things unfolded in the mid-aughts. So I'm gonna use this just to tell a story about a patient and remembering it's still about the patient. This, just is, me this is meant to be um, a cute State of the Union piece of where we were whenever there were, you know, 34 people in the room for every case we did. But this, um, this guy is an 88-year-old West Texas cabinet maker. You can read it. He's, he was a Marine. His first name is Major. He was an enlisted man, but whenever he wanted something for the colonel, the colonel would tell him to go get something, he would call him up and say, this is Major so-and-so, I need a Jeep. So he would get pretty much whatever he wanted just with his first name. Um, a really interesting, you know, nice West Texas guy. And uh, he was frustrated because he still had mesquite trees to cut down. And his family said he was the best cabinet maker west of Dallas. So uh, he was anxious to get this thing fixed. Um, you know, we can take a lot of pictures and, and show everything. Many of you experienced some of this, uh, but I was hoping that Bill would still be here. Uh, you have to buy him a drink at the bar to talk about, you know, when we went to the first case, uh, one of the first cases at Columbia, uh, literally it was standing room only. The room was packed. There were people spilling out in the hall. They kind of shoved Mac and I in the hall and just everybody wants to see this and do it. And you, you know all the parts and pieces that we went through to get here. Um, our surgeons were, um, you know, somewhat the smartest guy in the room and knew and thought that cardiologists were slobs and there was no way that you had a sterile enough environment in the cath lab or that we could do this without infecting our patients if we didn't do it in the OR. The only problem was we didn't have a hybrid lab. So we did the first cases with a C-arm. Uh, and the only problem with that was it turns out you can't see the valve. So we did the first two cases. In the second case, Lars Svensson was there. Samir had been there. And uh, we deployed the valve. It looks kind of good. Uh, and the next thing you see is this valve spinning in the aorta. Like we kind of missed the entire annulus and uh, the entire part of the, the aorta that we were after. Uh, so then we moved to the cath lab and had real imaging. The other interesting part of it was um, in uh, a steering committee, uh, probably around 2005, uh, a lot of things were going on and I asked Mac, Craig Smith, and Lars, how many patients they had turned down for surgery with aortic stenosis the year before? And the answer was zero. This was easy. You know, hey, we, don't, we could cure aortic stenosis. Anybody, you send us anybody up to 100, we can fix them. And then they all came crawling out of the woodwork and you know the rest of the story. They got to see inoperable patients and we got to go through these things for a while. So uh, with that in mind, you know, some of the early stuff, just as, this is in hospital outcome. In a minute we'll compare it to one year outcome, but you can see the numbers, numbers that nobody is proud of. We were causing all kinds of vascular complications putting in the 24, 28 French sheath. Um, I first started closing in with, you know, three proglides and we, uh, you know, we created enough catastrophes uh, that we managed to save most of, uh, that, that we lived on edge every time we were gonna do a case. And you can imagine what uh, some of that did to us. So how did we get here, uh, you might ask? Uh, well, this is what you all see and do now, right? I mean, this is just a different world. Uh, we don't even really get them to moderate sedation. Um, I had to teach the surgeons, stop telling the anesthesiologist they're moving, all right? We want them to move, we like them to move, we want them to be awake, we want them to get up and move. So uh, much like all of you now, uh, no cut downs, uh, none of the other fancy stuff, it's just get the case done. So what does that lead to? Well, it moves from the difference of taking, you know, half a day and all kinds of arrangements to get a case done uh, to we try to have four cases done by noon so our anesthesiologists can play golf at one. I'd like to tell you I'm kidding, but I'm not. Um, and generally, uh, we're going to do the case in 20 to 30 minutes. Um, we don't, we're not trying for records, but oftentimes the case will, uh, in very slow methodical pace, unfold and be 18 or 19 minutes skin to skin. So it's a dramatic difference about where we are and where we've been. Uh, I'm gonna show you something in the story that if you were here whenever Adam was talking this morning about you know, what's unfolding in the future. 
Here's the, you know, we had him in the hospital a week. We had ICU for two or three days. We had the world checking on him. You know, nobody got rounded on more than they did. Today, uh, we are near 85% with one day discharge and 95% of them go home in less than two days. And this is people going home, all right? So this isn't the in-hospital outcome we talked about a while ago, but this is now uh, one-year outcomes. And, you know, there's a multiplicity of different things with different trials, different valves, uh, and even the TVT registry is headed in this direction. Essentially what we call zero mortality, looking to go 12 consecutive months with zero mortality in a lot of things. And um, y you know where all that's come. All the reasons why we could do it from technology to experience to volumes. And uh, many of you know uh, Bruce Lytle who built uh, the Heart and Vascular Institute at Cleveland for over uh, 35 plus years. And uh, he, he came to join us after that bit. And so Bruce said, you know, for a long time that TAVR is not real heart surgery. He even now has come to accept that the TAVR in 2019 is not real heart surgery because this is replacing the aortic valve with virtually nothing happening. So can you turn that up by any chance? Do you have volume of that? No? So I'm sure you can't hear this. It's just on my computer, I think, right? Um, so this was uh, fourth case of the day with a little bit before noon start. And um, this is him, you know, after his case is done, he's awake in bed, he's 88 years old. And uh, I'm fundamentally asking him, uh, you know, what does he want to get back to do? And the issue was that he wanted to get back to cutting down his mesquite trees, chopping wood, and making cabinets. And literally, as I said earlier, his, uh, his family uh, told me the bit I said a while ago. And uh, so the end of this piece is I simply told him that he needed to get better, get up and go home because I needed some cabinets for the new house. So that's at uh, 1.30. And I'm sorry you're not going to be able to hear this. but. Uh, he had lunch at 2.30, he was up in the chair, started walking at 4, and at uh, 5 he started walking two laps and three laps, and he just kept walking um, about the time the, uh, our nurse practitioner called me. And uh, fundamentally, the John Webb's obligatory breakfast that you most know is this is him at obviously 5.30. Um, and he had been walking all these laps. I was talking to him about that and uh, ask him if he had had lunch, and I'd heard that he'd had breakfast for lunch. What'd you have for lunch? And his answer was that he had scrambled eggs, pancakes, toast, jelly and butter, and coffee, his coffee. So I said, did you have bacon? He said, nope, no bacon, protected my heart. And um, fundamentally, this is me telling him he's done everything, got a new valve, he's up walking, he's breathing normally, he's dressed and uh, there's probably no reason to keep him in the hospital. So he went home at 6.30, post Tavers LOS, six hours. Um, you can imagine all the things to say about this and uh, all the assaults. So I won't even try to justify it, but um, I have fundamentally sent people home with PCI, uh, with pacemakers, with virtually everything for over 20 years and uh, sent AAA, uh, you know, aneurysms home the next day whenever the surgeon says it wasn't kosher. So this is part of uh, what we do. And um, Molly has taken this piece and turned our entire institution into essentially a 24-hour discharge. And you've got to really do something special to not go home in less than 24 hours. So uh, thank you very much. All right, everybody, we're going to go finish up here with Innovative Therapy with Transcatheter Mitral Repair by Dr. Bridge Maney. Oh, he did not make it. So, again, well, we finished ahead of time, folks. Thank you for coming. <laughs>
Appreciate it.